<laughs> anyway, I talked to uh, my good friend Rich Bikini the other day. He managed to slip through the cone of silence that's over the castle and because we had to discuss something. Um, and one of the things that we talked about, I wanted to bring up on the program here because we were talking about just the some of the old great wrestling arenas closing down and the new arenas all looking the same and not having personality. And, you know, they got then Providence, Rhode Island up there where, near where he's from. They've got the Dunkin Donuts arena. It just, the names are so silly. <clears throat> and one of the, um, one of the buildings that we brought up was the Spartanburg Memorial auditorium where Crockett did all those TV tapings, uh, back in the eighties. So people have seen so much of that building. They might not necessarily even know where it was, but it's the, the place that looks like a combination of a high school gym with, with concrete fucking posts on the edges. That's the best way I can describe it, what it looks like on TV. But that brought up when we were discussing that building and, and, you know, some of the things that we had done there, the difference in modern day modern day preparation and the schedule that we used to have to keep, I guess, for lack of a better fucking word because i was talking about the building i was explaining well it was just it was so hot in the fuck especially in the summertime you know in the winter time when it was two thousand people in there you would it wouldn't be cold because it was the body heat and tv lights but in the summertime it was so hot and the locker rooms were so small um the heels locker room was probably let's say about 15 by 15 feet and as i recall it had either one or two toilets with stalls in the actual room so if you're you know if you're in the locker room getting dressed you're looking at the guy's ankles while he's taking a shit right and then that's why the baby faces got the good one because theirs was about 15 by 15 also but they had a little bathroom you could go into that had two stalls but a door closed so you could be in, in private right and the the small room about six by six feet that that was in the middle of them where the monitor sat and baby doll sat because she was the only girl on the fucking roster and there was no place for the girls to dress. And then you go right out the door and there you either go out the back door in the parking lot or into the arena. That's it. And every member of Crockett Promotions' roster plus all those job guys would be jammed in there on top of one another. That's why we would only be uh, asked to arrive an hour before bell time. That was standard back in those days, even for TV tapings. So if the bell time was 7.30, we'd get there at 6.30. We'd go in, put our stuff down, look at it. JJ would have taped a, a piece of paper up on the wall with the lineup written in Dusty's fucking shorthand where he wrote down a nickname or a initial for everybody um versus so and so and once you knew what you were doing then you'd get back outside go back outside especially in the summertime in the parking lot where the fans couldn't come out where you could get some air and also that you might do some bird watching look for some pigeons that would come to the top of the hill and chirp at you so you'd make arrangements on how to feed them but the show started at 7:30 they rolled tape on the first hour of syndication which was nwa worldwide wrestling in those days which was live to tape there was no post-production if we if the announcers pitched to a vtr they rolled it in the truck and then came back to the announce desk or to the interview set or whatever and so the first taping was done at, at 8 30 because or at, at 8 30 yeah that was a fucking hour then you took a 15 minute intermission then you did the second taping mid-atlantic wrestling which later became nwa pro live to tape roll the tape they even rolled three and a half minutes of black for the commercials boom that's over with it at, at uh 9 45 you put your dark match on you're done at 10 o'clock and you're out of the fucking building because everybody had to get up and go to school the next day or go to work or do whatever the fuck the normal people did so they didn't want to sit there till fucking midnight either so that's it, it, and it with two thousand people jammed into that building, which you could just barely get them in, and some of them would have to fucking look around, you know, concrete columns in the back corners of the bleachers, or bend over to see the ring from the overhang of the ceiling or whatever. But we were only in there for three and a half hours, 
and we got two hours of television, an intermission, and a fucking main event dark match out of it. There was no, that's why I, we started laughing when I said we didn't go over shit because we never got to, we were talking about the old buildings. I never saw them, the inside of them without people in them in a lot of cases because we were never there before the doors were open for the fans to be in the arena. So we never went outside till it was time for the show. So in Spartanburg, that's where the, the James boys, Brian, as you remember, fucking kidnapped me and put the noose over my neck and tied me to the back of baby dolls, pickup truck, etc. We were doing live lynchings with no rehearsals. It was like dusty would bring us in and, and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. So the Jane boys are going to hit the ring and Cornette would grab you. We'll put the rope around your neck and Megan, Megan going to carry you. And I got the rope and we're going to take you out back and the camera will follow us. And then when we tie you off to the bumper hitch, then here comes the midnight express, try to save you and baby doll. I'll jump in the back and I'll slap the window and you just take off. But they've already got the noose from around his neck. Okay. There was no thought to, should we walk through this? <laughs> Which is why the shit didn't look so fucking choreographed and planned as it does today. It gave it an element of spontaneity. You can't deny that, right? Uh, but now guys are in the building for a TV taping at fucking noon. It might be earlier now. I think it used to be either noon or one. The last time I was around paying attention. And you're there till fucking, you know, past eleven o'clock at night or whatever. You, the depending on the the time of their live television in the WWE or whoever's doing what, and they've wrung every bit of spontaneity and life and ad lib and out of it with just going over and producing and rearranging and choreographing and it, it's 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 just wrung all the life out of it now. You, that's what, I think that's one of the big reasons why everybody says, yeah, that shit in the 80s, God damn it, it looked like they kind of meant it because we were making half of it up as we went along trying to fucking do what Dusty or in other territories, whoever the booker was, said, well, you can do this, and it sounded it sounded good at the time. Sometimes you have to fucking make changes in the middle. Sometimes you should teach Baby Doll how to drive a stick so she wouldn't <laughs> nearly behead me. <laughs> but anyway, let's be um, honest. She may have wanted to behead you. In well, and, and she may have been anxious to, <laughs> but the point is that got me started thinking about the differences in the wrestlers schedule on the road. And it, it, you hear all the guys these days, and I'm not going to piss on everybody being on the road, especially now, if you have to fly is ludicrous and just traveling now, even before the pandemic is just a pain in the ass. But I hear so many of the guys these days talking about the travails and and trials and tribulations of being on the road all the time. And then I look at the schedule and I go, the, the worst thing about the modern wrestling schedule on the road and the travel has to be the fucking boredom. I don't know how these people do it out of the boredom. It's the last thing that we ever were in those days, except on occasionally some car trips, was bored. Because we were usually in a panic to get somewhere or to, to get back from somewhere. So there was there was very little book because now guys fly everywhere. So they're just sitting on planes with somebody else doing the work or they're waiting in an airport for somebody else to tell them when to leave. Or they're in the fucking building for these TV tape, even the fucking outlaw shows that they all get together. Cause you know, Hey kids, let's put on a show. They want to visit with each other beforehand. So they sit in the fucking shows all fucking day. And the poor guys at ring of honor. Now I've just read the, on the internet, but part of the COVID protocol is they come in a week early and sit in a hotel room by themselves for a week to make sure that they're, and while they're being tested and everything and have food delivered to the door. What the fuck? I would go out of my mind. I would turn a Hampton Inn into a bell tower if I was in a hotel room by myself for a fucking week. But somebody 
I'll have his name here in a second. Somebody sent another email that tickled me and got me started thinking about all this stuff. I'm going to tie this whole thing together in a minute, Brian. Are you, are you tired of waiting? I'm curious where you're going. Okay. Sean wrote... Big fan of the podcast. Thank you for sharing your insight with us every week. I've had this question in mind for a long time. How common was it for non-wrestlers, i.e. managers, bookers, office guys, etc., to work out with the wrestlers? I know Vince worked out with Hogan, and I believe Bruce Pritchard has mentioned working out and tanning with Randy Savage. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, no, tanning, I believe. Tanning, I believe. Um, and additionally, here's the question that Sean asked. Did you ever work out with any of the boys? Sean, you don't know me very well, do you? <laughs> I have never, I've not only never worked out with the boys, I've never worked out with anybody else either. I have been on exercise equipment otherwise than because it was in the dressing room, you know, in some building that we were fucking, I was sitting on it while I was changing my clothes. I've been on exercise equipment and meant it. Whenever I had physical therapy on my knees or by my hip several years ago. Otherwise, I have never in my adult life exercised on purpose. I got exercise as a byproduct of, of doing things. Um, but it, no, and I've never seen any, any, anybody else work out unless we were there shooting video of it for a fucking video. So that, but here's the thing. <laughs> I'm going to tie all this together now. Talking about me working out with the boys, talking about um, the, the Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium and the schedule we had for television, talking about all the, the, the guys saying the road is so hard, all made me realize that the wrestlers of today don't even understand what the wrestlers of yesterday's schedule was like, and the wrestlers of yesterday. I don't think know what the fuck the wrestlers of today's schedule is like because it's completely different and we're getting we're getting two different products because it's being produced in two completely different ways now. Um, as I mentioned, back then we literally worked so much and we're going to illustrate this. We've done deep dives before on wrestling matches and wrestling finishes and wrestling programs, but never actually really with a specific thought of just where we were going and how long it took us to get there and what we did along the way. Even the, the guys in the WWE pre pandemic, when they were running house shows, am I correct in assuming Brian, that they were on a four day a week schedule, one, one day of TV and two or three days of house shows. In adjoining. That sounds about right. I don't know for certain, but because if right. you were on Raw, you're on Raw. If you're on SmackDown, you're on SmackDown, and they had a couple of whatever the fuck. And so, and yes, because you can't live in a territory anymore. Uh, you can't just drive to the show anymore unless it just happens once a year or so to be where you live. So that requires flying out, and then the next day after a show, you got to spend most of the day flying back. So that shoots a lot of your week. But you are going to those shows and sitting there, especially on the television taping, to be in the building for 10 hours or so, and at least a number of hours uh, at the house shows. The independent guys we mentioned, if it's not the WWE, uh, the independent guys that work over the weekends, most of the time, nobody runs wrestling shows these days on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and usually not Thursdays. It's usually weekend work, right? So the guys are out on the road on the weekends. And they say it's so tough to eat on the road. It's so tough to train on the road. It's so tough to get there where we can rehearse our matches on the road. <laughs> they don't. I sympathize with everybody that has to be away from home. But, Brian, you know the difference. Do you honestly think that anybody today can claim a more difficult, any performers in the wrestling business today can claim a more difficult travel schedule than any of the guys had in the territories in, in years gone by? I mean, there were some territories that light schedules, but primarily I would say no. And that's what the Fullers were very popular people because they always operated and started up short trip territories. Knoxville was a short trip territory. Pensacola, a short trip territory. 
Now, Florida was a popular not only because you got to work with Eddie Graham, also because the weather was great most all the year, but also because you really only worked in the one state. And that that fucking, you know, uh, Jacksonville was occasionally a pain in the ass, or what was it, Tallahassee, but, you know, whatever. But anyway, um, they don't, it, it, there was, a, now all the guys spend all their time talking to each other and overthinking their shit and going over their shit endlessly and spending all their time trying to make every television match the main event at fucking WrestleMania. And then they're bitching about being on the road when the road for them is the easiest part. Here's another thing, training and eating right. When I was in the WWF in the 90s, the catering was what Vince McMahon considered what athletes should eat. Unseasoned grilled chicken breasts, plain fucking pasta with, with some kind of goddamn a little Parmesan cheese you might could sprinkle on it, salads and fruit, and none of it was all that fresh. It was fucking rotten catering. The last time I went, when I was down there for the Hall of Fame thing in 2017, catering had been turned into a five-star restaurant. I was in, I never ate the catering in the 90s. I always either sent downtown Bruno or Brooklyn Brawler out when they would go on a food run for one of the stars. I'd give them some extra money or I'd bribe one of the local guys that wasn't working to fucking go get me a cheeseburger. But the catering was fucking awful. It was food for people who just ate because they, they needed to do it to be healthy, but they didn't want to enjoy it, like Vince. The fucking modern catering, as I said, I had the best salmon I've ever had. They had beef. They had seafood. They had chicken. They had goddamn condiments. It looked like a convenience store. I spent all my time in there, especially the WWE guys. They're on the road. Well, they've got a goddamn, I don't know if it now with COVID, but fucking catering blew my mind. Brian, in the territories, I know there were guys that ate right, and I know there were guys that worked out. Obviously, you could tell because of their physiques, and they had incredible dedication to be able to find the time to do it. But like Flair, before he was NWA champion, Flair, the workout freak that he was, he put a gym in his fucking house. Not a treadmill, not a bike, not a bench press, a gym, an actual gym in his house because that was the only way he could visit it and still make the fucking shots. So I thought it might be fun. Ha ha. Feel, feel free to shoot me down on this now, Brian. I thought it might be fun if we just went and looked back of a couple of weeks in the territories and uh, our schedule, which I have access to because I kept all my shit and... I want you as as a casual observer to explain to me <laughs> when the fuck that any of us were supposed to go to the gym and work out. I like what do you this. think? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Which territory? You, I mean, if it's mid south, well, I don't it, know how you're going to do it. Well, it, it actually it, it, here's the thing. By by the time that we got to Crockett, it wasn't just the mid Atlantic territory anymore because they'd opened up Philly and Baltimore, and we were flying. So I don't have. The, the the accurate records that I have in Memphis, we've established the schedule and it, it really didn't vary because all the towns were weekly and, and it was what it was. Uh, but and not everyone was working out. <laughs> and not everyone was working. Yeah. Um, but we never really got to work the mid-Atlantic territory when it was only the mid-Atlantic territory. And having said that, there were some long trips in that thing, too. The double Charleston rib, Charleston, South Carolina to Charleston, West Virginia which would be somewhere around 500 miles when they'd book them back to back on, you know, successive days. Um, and, and because they were working, running two and sometimes three shows a night in North and South Carolina and Virginia every night of the week, you know, it was, it was hectic, but we never got to do that alone. So I went to mid South cause this is an example of what the guys, what their schedule would be like in the territories. Some were shorter. As we said, Memphis was a 2,000 mile a week uh, loop. So that was kind of mid range. It wasn't a short trip like uh, uh, Knoxville or Continental that we mentioned down in Pensacola. 
but it wasn't a mid south it wasn't calgary um it you know florida was shorter but georgia was florida and georgia were shorter than the carolinas by a long shot Fucking Vern had such a huge area in the Midwest that they had been flying from an early time anyway, and they only ran kind of a 15 to 20 day a month schedule. So anyway, the point is when in the territories of the seventies and eighties, this is the kind of thing you'd be doing. And this is why that most of the matches were called in the ring. This is why that, Everything that was done had a more spontaneous feel to it because it was probably the first time that it had been done, or especially on promos. We did very little shit over, called the matches as they happened, heard the finishes an hour before we went out to do the match, and in a lot of cases, not able to speak to the opponents. <clears throat> but... Explain to me how you have a personal life when you do this and explain to me why all these fucking guys who have this fucking weekend schedule now are bitching about life on the road. Or in the case of some of them, they flip out and they say, oh, we're living the life of rock stars. So we've got to assault a bunch of people over it. This was not a rock star's life here. I'm about to describe to you. Let's just start off with Monday, Monday, April 2, 1984. We're living in Alexandria, Louisiana, which is the midpoint in the state of Louisiana. Uh, most of the towns are, uh, are either north or south or east or west. We're right in the middle of it, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't pick Alexandria, Louisiana as a place you wanted to live, especially in 1984. We're in Baton Rouge. That's a gimme. It's only 100 miles each way. And we had to be in the building at 6.30 or we'd get fined $50 because the show started at 7.30. The shows back then started at 7.30 on weeknights, usually 8 o'clock on Friday and Saturday because people needed to get fucking have time to get off of work, get home, eat something, and grab the kids and get to the wrestling matches. And they didn't want to stay up past 11 o'clock on weeknights so you tried to have the show over with by 10 so the guys could get on the road and so the people could get home because they wouldn't bring the kids back next time if they kept them out too late. So the show ran from 7.30 to a little before 10 o'clock. I don't care if there were five matches or fucking 12. Somehow it worked out. So for that, we'd leave about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd meet the boys, Bobby Stan, or Bobby Stan, this was Dennis. Bobby and Dennis and I would meet right next to the McDonald's uh, in uh, Alexandria because that was where Dennis was living at the beautiful Alexandria Motor Inn. And we'd get lunch at McDonald's. Actually, it'd be lunch for me and dinner for them because they would have gotten up somewhat early. Dennis used to work out in, at, in those days. He was, he was lifting and going to the gym, and he was single in the, at this time, so he had some extra time. He'd get up and occasionally go to the gym and work out somewhere back in those days. Uh, Bobby was married, but Bobby did cardio every night when he was in the ring. Can you think of anybody, Brian, in 1984, the way they worked that got better cardio every night from just wrestling than Bobby Eaton? Now he's in constant motion. Perpetual anyways. motion. Yeah. At one time, I reached up to give him the Iggy grab his leg and give him the Iggy on a referee spot. And I grabbed his calf and I thought I'd grab the ring post. He was hard as a fucking rock. He just had no muscles that would show. Uh, anyway, so we'd leave at four o'clock. We'd have lunch at McDonald's. We'd fucking get to the show at six 30, the Baton Rouge centriplex bell time, seven 30 showed be over at 10 o'clock and we're back on the road and we're home by midnight. Baton Rouge was an easy one. Of course, when after we got out of there, well, if we got back before midnight, I would eat at home. But usually after the matches, I'm on the search for fucking food. Some things have never changed. Because the boys would get up earlier, so they'd have breakfast. That way, when they ate on our way to the show, that was really their dinner. Because then after the show was Miller time, and they were more concerned with drinking beer. Since I was going to sleep until a couple hours before I had to leave town, I never had breakfast, so my lunch at the fast food place on the way out of town was my breakfast, and then I wanted to eat as soon as we got out of there. But since I was usually driving back, sometimes even if it wasn't my car, if it was late at night and the boys wanted to drink, then 
they they uh, they humored me on the food. But anyway, um, the next day is another short trip, Shreveport, Louisiana. It's 130 miles from Alexandria. Of course, there were no north-south interstates in those days in the state of Louisiana, so it was all state highway. So you'd leave about 3.30, get there about 6.15, just so Grizzly wouldn't find you. If I can be done at 10 o'clock, and you're on the way back, and the same thing again, when we would meet for the ride, we'd go to stock up on some fucking fast food, take get to the town, get back, and in this case... I would not come back because Wednesday, Shreveport was interviews at the TV station. So while it was only, you know, two and a half hours up there after the show, I'd stay over at the beautiful Alamo Plaza Motor Inn. The boys could go on home. And then we would do interviews all day, the rest of us, at the TV station in Shreveport. And then that night, had to go to Jackson, Mississippi which was 200 miles from Shreveport. So we'd start interviews at 9 o'clock in the morning, finish those about 3 o'clock, hop in the car, rush to get to Jackson. They wouldn't find us if we were late on the Wednesdays. There I'd meet up with the boys again. Boom, we'd do another fucking show and then head back to Alexandria, which was another 200 miles. So we would get home Wednesday night at somewhere around fucking uh, 2 in the morning from Jackson, Mississippi, because it was not all interstate. You're on the back roads, stop signs in little towns, speed traps, etc. So in that period from Tuesday afternoon until 2 a.m. Thursday morning, we've driven... 30, We've driven about 550 miles. We've worked two house shows, and I've done a six-hour stint of interviews. Do you see time to work out yet, Brian? No. Then (laughs) we get back to Alexandria Wednesday night, Thursday morning, about 2 o'clock, as I said. Well, the next day, we got to go to Crossit, Arkansas. Well, that's only 150 miles away, but it's up in freaking Arkansas. Did I mention all state highways, no interstate? And it's an outdoor show at a school gym, so we got to get there, make sure we find our way in. There's a 1,000 people there, so it's not bad. We're on the ball field with the Rock and Roll Express. But Hunter say we probably left about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we probably got home about 1 a.m. Because that was good, because that way we could sleep a little late the next day, because the next day was going to be a long day. Houston, Texas, 500 miles round trip. Not all interstate. Plus, it's a Friday. So even back in those days, when you get into Houston, Texas on a Friday evening, around about fucking 630, you had traffic, right? So we would leave, and to make sure we had time to stop and eat, And maybe even eat again if we left it fucking, because it's going to take every bit of five hours. And we got to be there by by 7 o'clock because the show's at 8. So we're going to leave at 1.30 because we're going to eat lunch in Alexandria and we're going to eat again before we fucking get to the building. Probably at a Dairy Queen somewhere around Beaumont or Port Arthur off the interstate. Um, We get there at 7 o'clock. Bell time eight, the Houston shows at the Sam Houston Coliseum. And thank goodness so much of the tape, it still exists because Paul Bosch tapes all of his events. Those mega shows with all those main event matches and all the stars that people see on YouTube, they never lasted three hours. You didn't have to, maybe the Superdome would probably go three, especially if Flair was on top. Um, but otherwise than that, these even these mega shows did not last three hours. People's asses went to sleep, plus you had to get out of there, get to the next town. So we'd be on the road by 11 o'clock. Out of Houston, nighttime travel was a little quicker. So we would goddamn probably be back home, oh, by fucking 3 or 3.30. And of course, you got to find something to eat. Back in those days, even the all-night drive throughs were few and far between. It's not like it is today. There were the basically restaurants and interstate exits were fewer and farther between in those days to begin with. A lot of times when we'd come back from Little Rock, Arkansas, we'd stop and eat dinner at a gas station because that was the only food 
that was still open between Little Rock and the Arkansas state line headed south. They did have wonderful smoked sausage on a stick, though. But anyway, so we're back from fucking Houston with whatever the fuck we've eaten still strewn all over the back seat of the fucking car about three o'clock in the morning. By the time you go to bed and get up, normally it would be noon, but in this case, the next day we got up earlier because the next day was New Orleans at the Superdome. Now, Houston was a 500-mile round trip going west of Alexandria. New Orleans was a 400-mile round trip going the other direction, east. And this was the first Superdome show, so I had to go down early and pick up Mama Cornette from the airport who came down to see me. However, <laughs> let's just say it was a typical New Orleans show. It's 200 miles. Again, it's not all interstate. You don't want to be late to the dome because of the traffic situation. It's downtown. So to be, and, and they did want us to be there earlier. So we probably left somewhere in the area of one o'clock in the afternoon. Drive three and a half to four hours by the time you stop and get something to eat. You're there at the dome. That's the latest show you'll be at. So we probably got out a little bit before midnight, dropped Mama Cornette back off at her hotel so she could fly out the next day and go back to Alexandria and get back literally at fucking three o'clock in the morning again. But it's okay because we don't have to leave, Brian, <laughs> for Oklahoma City, Oklahoma a nighttime show the next day on Sunday, not afternoon like it usually was, but a nighttime show until somewhere around, wait a minute, let me do the math, until somewhere around 11 o'clock Sunday morning. Because it's 530 miles from Alexandria, you had to take the state highway up to Shreveport, turn left, take the interstate 210 miles over to Dallas, turn right, and go another couple hundred miles up to Oak City. That was the quick way to do it. So we were back in our hometown about eight hours, turned around, left again, got to Oak City for the evening show about six o'clock, because as I said, that at that time was about between a seven and eight hour drive. And then we stayed over that night because the next day we were going to Little Rock, Arkansas, which was 330 miles back to the east of Oklahoma City. But at least it was across the interstate. They had an interstate up there even back then. So that only took about five and a half hours. So we left the next day about one o'clock. Are you finding any workout time yet? Not do you really. see when we went to the movies? Do you see when we had time to go out and have the after parties from all these shows? Or when we got to the building early so we could practice stuff and rehearse things and hang out with our friends? So after Little Rock, then the fun begins. That's, that's a Monday. Well, there was no interstate whatsoever between Little Rock, Arkansas, and Alexandria, Louisiana. It was 270 miles of state highway through every little town with stop signs, two-lane road. So even at night, with no traffic, it would take every bit of five to five and a half hours. So we would get back from Little Rock somewhere around 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. But it was a good thing because the next day was Lake Charles, and that was easy. That was only 100 miles. And so we could leave about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so we'd catch up on our sleep. Every day, we meet for the ride, we get the fast food, we go to the show, we get out, we find some place to get food at that time of night. There's always a convenience store to get the boys' beer, and we're back in a fucking car. Lake Charles, we leave at 4 o'clock on Tuesday. We go down there. We work the fucking show. We're back at about, eh, say, 1230. But that's a good thing because the next day's Wednesday. I have to leave Alexandria by 645 in the morning, counting rush hour through fucking Bunky and Nacogdoches to fucking get to Shreveport to do interviews by 9 o'clock. And we do interviews for another six hours. And then we have time. And thankfully, Bobby and Dennis didn't have to do interviews since I handled them. But all the other guys are there. Then we have just enough time to leave the TV station. The guys that wanted to would go to the bank there in Shreveport and cash their checks. 
go to the pizza king and have a fucking pizza and head on over to the Irish McNeil boys club. Cause we got two hours TV to shoot that night, which started at seven 30 finished up about 10 o'clock. And we were back home in Alexandria by midnight, which was a good thing because the next day was fucking Biloxi. Remember what I said about new Orleans being 200 miles, the other direction. Well, goddamn Biloxi, 60 miles past that. <laughs> so, and I fucking hated Biloxi. And so that is 250, 260 miles uh, each way. Literally a fucking five-hour drive. So we leave at fucking 1.30. We get to the building at 6.30. We leave at 10. We're back home at 3. The next day, Friday the 13th. Baton Rouge again. So we go back a hundred miles the direction that we just came the previous morning to go to Baton Rouge and a hundred miles back because we got a big weekend coming up. They probably gave us a good fucking rest there because on Saturday, April 14th, we had a matinee and an evening. Brookhaven, Mississippi at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon at a fucking high school, 300 mile round trip. We got back home just in time to work Alexandria that night where we were actually home so we could sleep in our beds and get home before the evening news because the next day on Sunday, April 15th, we were in Beaumont, Texas at the Civic Center at two o'clock in the afternoon, which meant we, since it's 160 miles, we had to leave for that show at fucking 10 a.m. So we left on Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning. We got to Beaumont at 1, we did the show at 2, we finished at 4, we drove another 90 miles to Houston, we worked a show that night, that was the last stampede, so we actually worked two matches that night, got out of there at almost 11 o'clock, and got back home to Alexandria at 3 a.m., so that was a 10, 5, 17-hour day. I haven't got any gym time yet. Have you, Brian? <laughs> Am I leaving anything out? What did I, did I leave out the time that we have all the fucking uh, time to sh tape the vignettes and everything and stuff? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to go on? There's another several weeks of this. Well, no, I think we've gotten the point We've here. got the idea. Let me just count one thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 12 13 14 holy shit we did we did a goddamn show on a friday afternoon at three o'clock in hughes springs texas i don't ever remember doing a friday afternoon fucking how does that draw i mean it's april schools it it was a in. school it was a school deal because we were in texarkana that night and they arranged a thing at the school and all the kids came to the school i remember it now all the kids came to the show because it was a school thing. Three o'clock after school got out. Did $5,300. That's about fucking 500 people. Actually more because kids tickets would have been cheaper. Anyway, I was counting 7, 14, 15, 16. 17 days later, I got a day off. After that schedule that I just uh, described to you. So you no, got a I day never, off. Did Dennis and Bobby get days off too? Yes, we all we all three had a Wednesday off. Okay. Um, because as a matter of fact, hold on and I'll 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 tell you. I just closed the goddamn thing, not knowing you'd ask a follow-up. But where was it? We were off of a uh Monroe, Louisiana show. <laughs> They're just <laughs> the card didn't quite work out. And then we had one, and these were with double shots every Sunday. And as I mentioned, that one week we did two shows on Friday in Texas. We were back in Alexandria uh, for the last stampede on the Saturday. And then did Sunday in Hammond, Louisiana in the afternoon and Lafayette, Louisiana in the evening. But anyway, after that day off that I mentioned, uh, it was one, two, three, well... Basically, there's it was another two weeks before we got another one. You didn't ask for a lot of days off because if you asked for days off, you'd get Houston off, New Orleans off, Oklahoma City off, all the big payoffs, and you'd still be working in Hughes Springs. 
But that's it, that's what. So when you hear guys from the '80s and the WWF complain about their schedule, which is all over the country and a lot of it's on planes, what do you think? Who had it rougher? Guys working from mid south after oh. Watts took over McGurk's territory, and he had Louisiana and Oklahoma, or guys who worked for Vince in the let's say late '80s. Well, the well, late '80s is. De- those guys, it would have been worse for me, the WWF schedule, because those guys were not only flying everywhere, which I always hated and used as a means to an end to do what I was loving, but they would actually be on the road without going to their homes for 15 or 20 days at a time. Whereas, as you can see, we would go home, and the, the guys in the territories would be home a lot as far as often, they would just wouldn't be home a lot as far as time. You'd get home in time to go to bed, get up and leave again in a lot of cases. Even in Memphis, it was still hectic. And that was a, you know, a shorter trip territory. But that's why I'm saying the difference in the territory, because you can't say that the WWF in, in the 80s was a territory schedule. Crockett, by, the, by 1986, wasn't really a standard territory schedule. I, you know, guys like the Sheik, who fucking he loved to make his trips in his territory. He loved to travel with the boys. He loved to have the fucking, he loved to do the car trips. He loved being on the road. You can imagine him, but he also liked to go home and be with his family. So he would, he would go from Detroit to Cincinnati and then go back home that night. He also had a limo. Well, he had a limo, but still, (laughs) yes, but then he'd go back to Dayton the next day. Just, you know, but Grizzly Smith, who, I I can't imagine how he did this, especially at his size. It had to be so uncomfortable. But he made the Mid-South schedule. All the guys that worked there for it, DiBiase said, I worked there for a year and a half. My hair was falling out and I wanted to quit the business, right? It broke everybody. Grizzly is the only guy that did it all those years. Himself, on and uh, on and on and on without leaving the territory because he was Watts' agent. So he probably... For what from the last the the falling out that he had with Watts when he was booking for the Culkins in Mississippi was what, seventy-eight ish? So by nineteen seventy-nine or so, until the end of Mid South Wrestling, Grizzly made every fucking town that I'm aware of and never stepped foot on a plane. After the deal and he was going to Puerto Rico one time, I think in the early seventies. And the landing gear wouldn't come down and they had to foam the runway and they were telling people this could be it. And he told himself, and I can identify with this. If I get down, I ain't getting on another one of these motherfuckers. And he did and he didn't. So he would, I mean, we had a couple, as you can see from that schedule, there was many times where I would go two days without eating a meal anywhere else but in our car. But he lived, he would have a, young preliminary baby face or heel, whoever was not making a lot of money and he'd have him drive, drive Grizzly's car. So he, it didn't cost the guy any trans, no gas, didn't put miles on his car. Grizzly would fix him up with his hotel, whatever, but he, you know, Brickhouse Brown did it. Everybody did it at one point, but Grizzly was in that car and he was the first one to the fucking show and the last one to leave. It was, it was amazing. Anyway, that's the difference in life on the road today and life on the road back then and, and any of the territories. When you could, the, the fucking West Texas territory was a long trip territory from what I've been told. And I mean, I've been to those places. I never worked that territory. I can't imagine driving between fucking Amarillo, Lubbock, Midland, Odessa, out to Albuquerque and across Tucumcari on a weekly basis that had to be insane. Terry Funk told me one time they did their TVs. I think on like a a Saturday or a Sunday morning after some long trip that was like eight hours away up in New Mexico or whatever. And they fucking left late and had to drive a hundred and some miles an hour to get to this fucking, they were just, but West Texas is so flat. You could get away with it out there. But anyway, there were, it was always, that's the thing. When you left, when you left at the right time, you still would encounter traffic. I remember one time we were in Texas and the first time we were in Texas on Easter, 
and didn't realize everybody in Texas on Easter Sunday is on the fucking highway because they're all Catholic. And we were trying to get to Houston before we got fined. And, and Dennis Condry was driving 70 miles an hour down the goddamn uh, the shoulder of the road, the emergency lanes, trying to get there. Uh, things would happen and you'd pretty much every couple of days you'd be in some kind of panic wondering if you were going to get to your next shot. So there was a lot of time to dwell on these dramatic morality plays that the guys come up with in their minds or, you know, practice things or rehearse things or whatever the fuck it was. You get there, you get the gist of what you're doing. You know who you're working with. You fucking do it. You go and you leave and you do it again the next day or sometimes later that day. And it was, it was hectic to lead that life, but it led to a lot better performances. It seems like. Well, you know, it's too bad when you were on the road and you need a place to eat. Back then, you didn't have too many options. You didn't have something like Magic Spoon that you could take well, you, with you on the road. You are exactly right. Because, you know, from the time, from the time that I was a kid and I would always be told, oh, you shouldn't eat cereal. Cereal's bad for you. All the sugar and the carbs and the unhealthiness. It, it was, it, cereal was looked at as junk food. Well, no more, because now you can have great tasting cereal and not feel guilty about eating it. Our friends at Magic Spoon are back. I don't know where they've been. They haven't been anywhere. We've, we've gone away. They've been right here producing amazing cereal. Cocoa flavored, fruity flavored, frosted flavored, blueberry flavored. Tastes amazing. Too good to be true. We've been raving about it forever. Keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, low carb, GMO free. I don't know how the heck they do this stuff because it's so free of everything. You'd think there'd be nothing left, but it it is. It's goodness. Three net grams of carbs in each serving, 11 grams of protein, no sugar whatsoever. Your kids are eating it. Stacy eats it. You eat it. You can take it around like snack, eat it like popcorn. You don't even need to put the milk on it. It's amazing. Are you still in love with your magic spoon? Oh, yeah. I love that frosted one. That's my favorite. Uh, blueberry, I think. is, But the fruity, <laughs> all of it's good. Anyway, folks, if you want to have the best tasting, healthiest cereal on the planet today, and that is absolutely not a an exaggeration or hyperbolic, Go to magicspoon.com slash gym. Grab a variety pack. Get one of each. Try the goodness today. The promo code is gym. At checkout, you will get free shipping. Use the promo code gym when you go to magicspoon.com and get free shipping on a variety pack. They're so confident in the quality and the goodness of Magic Spoon. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money and not even interrogate you about it. No questions asked. We thank Magic Spoon for being our sponsors, and we thank them for providing us with healthy breakfast. And unlike, as we've been talking about breakfast so often lately, unlike all the syrup and butter and bread and carbs that you like in that french toast that's right put it all on me and <laughs> well i you know I, hey I, it's, it's i eat like i eat healthy low carb sausage gravy you need more magic spoon in your life i've well, got lots of magic spoon in my life i even well, got they have a special magic spoon bowl and spoon that i bought wait a minute now you have your own magic spoon bowl and spoon now yes. where you eat your magic spoon cereal i saw it on their website and i said you know what when i have my frosted magic spoon cereal i want it to be in this multicolored psychedelic looks like something that would have been on billy graham's tights in the 70s i said i need this bowl and that's what i got well and also it doubles it that way you can get your hair cut the same thing what turn a bowl over the top of your head and get your hair cut did your mom ever do that to you no, the the bowl wouldn't fit on my head. My head was too pointy. It didn't fit right. Anyway, Magic Spoon, folks. I'm, more Magic Spoon in my diet and less biscuits and gravy is what you're trying to tell me. That's what I'm insisting on. We need you to be healthy for years to come of great podcasting and 
wonderful pontifications about the world of professional wrestling. I will, I will take that under consideration. I'll try to live as long as I possibly can.